Welcome to another episode of the VD Clinic Podcast. I am Darren, and with me, as always, is... Vanessa. Oh, you're not going to introduce me? <laughs> uh, Vanessa McHenry. That either took Hi. a really long time for me to say, or no time at all, depending on how the edit went. <laughs> exactly. I was, yeah. Anyway, hi, how are you doing? I am doing well, and you sound like you're doing well. I hear purring over there on the other side of that microphone. That is Zora. That is Zora. Zora is settled in. Zora has, yes. Do not know if they are going to randomly attack the recycling. That usually happens early, so. Um, no, that, that, um... I, not lately. No, not lately. Knock, knock on wood. Yeah. So. Well. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. Uh, let's see. Speaking of attacks. <laughs> Speaking of attacks. Yes. We are here to talk about the 1996. Is it Milos? Is that how you say Milos Foreman? Or is it Milos? I've, I've always heard Milos. Okay. Foreman, directed. That doesn't mean it's right. <laughs> Milos or Milos, Foreman, or some other pronunciation. Uh, the People versus Larry Flint, starring Woody Harrelson, Ed Norton, Courtney Love, uh, <laughs> James, I saw James Carvel in there. Uh, uh, who, uh, Larry Flint, of course, cameoing as his least favorite judge. Well, yeah, I have a lot to say about the casting. There's, there's a, there's a lot of a cast to get into, but, um, before we get into the movie, um, it, in, 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 in all of it, um, uh, I have a feeling we're going to have a lot to say about this um, because, well, I have a lot of weird connections with this, <laughs> with, with the, with the whole, I don't know, the locations of where the people are like where we're from or took place and 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 it's just kind of funny um and it's gonna be yet another episode where i get to talk about a killer it, this is a serial killer in fact that i get to talk about and uh mine i i do not sorry have... No, no. Sorry, I, you didn't think I was going to go down that rabbit hole? <laughs> I, you, you never know. So you didn't I think I'd bring my A game? <laughs> I try not to set up any expectations because it's always good. Uh, mine was more, I don't know, background. Uh, like, I think I said when I picked the movie, you know, my best friend's dad was a cartoonist for many things, but one of the... One of his employers was he worked for Larry Flint Publications for something like 15, 20 mm -hmm. years. So, you know, Larry Flint would sometimes call the house. Uh, his dad yeah. was always going to the parties and shit. Uh, and he got, um, you know, we Aaron and I had uh, our longest running band I was ever in. Uh, he played guitar. So 
our one of our CDs got reviewed in Hustler. Uh, really? Yeah. Uh, he handed off uh, some of our CDs when he was out at one of the Hustler mansion parties. And one of the guys was the guy that did the music <laughs> reviews. So one of our EPs, I'm pretty sure it was our Ants on the Hill one. And it had, you know, this. it was the, the Darren type of band. So the cover was... Like the Statue of Liberty sticking out of an anthill surrounded by freeways and the freeways mm. are covered with ants. And yeah. It was, uh, yeah. It was like reviewed in Hustler. <laughs> pretty okay. nice. Pretty nicely, too. I mean, we were. I, I don't know, maybe 18, 19. Mm -hmm. uh, something like that. Um, but yeah, so <laughs> there were a lot of Larry Flint. um impressions going around the house over, yeah. over at his house and you know as a pubescent young lad it was really cool discovering the giant trunk in the garage filled with every magazine that he was ever published in uh, right <laughs> and yeah and I think he helped I think he drew our album cover uh, he did a couple real bands album covers but i think he did our album cover and that was um yeah uh i don't know uh so it, it was kind of like in the background but you know I've, I've been to cincinnati a handful of times but i don't really recognize any of the stuff down there and uh, the most i'm ever anywhere in california is always san francisco or the bay area and yeah, so the locations and stuff, and I, yeah. Uh, so anyway, out of my ramble. Well, yeah, I recognize, I recognize the locations because, what, this came out? 96. 96. I was living there at that time, and I that's what I thought, that it was filmed there when I was living there. But when I lived there... In the 90s, uh, Simon Lease <laughs> was that James Carville plays was still doing this kind of censorship BS and going after Larry Flint and Hustler and in the and they were, he was helping to prosecute, like, strip clubs. So the Hustler Club was, like, right outside, the big strip club was right outside of Hamilton County. And it, like, had all these, was free of all these restrictions that Hamilton County didn't have. <laughs> You know, and, but Simon Lease and his crew had partially pushed Larry Flint out of the county as far as the Hustler Club. Um, but the magazine, and it was, they were, the law, they were also using this law to go after all these LBG, all, all these LGBTQ magazines, um, of course, because why not? <laughs> um, and it was, they were trying to shut down any like bookstores that sold these items. Um, yeah, it was, it was kind of crazy. I, I mean, I remember all of that going, going on and it was really, really strange that like, how long had this been going on? And like Larry Flint was just laughing at it because it was kind of like, are you fucking kidding me? How many decades? You're still after, you're like a dog that's still chasing after this bone. And 
he had gone after it, like Simon Lee's had gone after Maplethorpe and a group of all all these other artists and the con, the Cincinnati uh, Contemporary Arts Center. Uh, you know, yeah, I remember hearing about that earlier. Please. Right, exactly. Uh, and that was also connected to, you know, there were cases related with Jesse Helms at that same time and that in National Endowment of the Arts. That was a little earlier, but it was still a bunch of these same people that, you know, and I can't remember when Charles Keating got bumped out of the mix because of the savings and loan scandal. Oh, right. <laughs> I love that. I love that bit. I love that bit. That's the part of this story that kind of, I, I, yeah, I find interesting. And the sweet justice. <laughs> I think the Lincoln banking thing was 88 or 89. Yeah, I thought it was in the 80s. I mean, from what I remember, because... I thought I hadn't graduated high school yet. Okay. But I didn't know if I was out of middle school. Yeah, real quick, I looked and just yeah. said Lincoln failed in 89. Uh, in the early 90s, Keating was convicted in both federal and state courts. <laughs> of fraud, racketeering, and conspiracy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yes. Uh, what what but, else? <laughs> go ahead. No, I was going to say, uh, what else did you have to add on the uh, the Cincinnati location? Because that's pretty much where this movie starts. I, I I I would be surprised if somebody was listening to this that hadn't seen the movie yet. Uh, that's a thing that comes up on like every other of episode of every podcast uh, that talks about this. But um, so, I mean, there's the really early thing where he's a moonshiner in Kentucky. And then it, uh, I'm just trying to make an honest book. And then it's Cincinnati and Woody well, Harrelson and, it, and his brother playing Larry Flint's l little brother. And yeah, I, and that was, I, I like that. That was a nice touch that they had Woody Harrelson's actual brother playing like Larry Flint's brother. <laughs> like, you know, so, okay. And uh, that was a nice touch. Kind of like having Larry Flint have a cameo in here. Having Larry Flint's actual bodyguard play essentially himself in here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, his actual doctor, one of them, play him. Uh, so, yeah, uh, the Hustler Club, Cincinnati. So, so anyway, uh, yes. Yeah, so as I was, yeah, as we were saying, I, I think I think it's great that you have, like, and his actual bodyguard, you know, playing his actual bodyguard. Like, they were in the mansion, you know... His own mansion was used as his his mansion in the movie. I like I I like that there were those little touches. You know, it it gave it a little bit more authenticity, even though yes, there were some liberties taken <laughs> some here and yeah. there. Just just a few, but some some major ones, I think. As, yeah. as you would expect when anyone tells you their life story. Right. They like to put themselves, generally like to put themselves in the, in relatively the best light. Right. So, you know what, the, the, the racketeering charges might have been closer than um, the movie would lead you to believe. Not that he I mean, just just in that what early distribution of the magazine had more relations to companies owned by the mafia mob. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it, but although no, I will say. 
if you notice, he gives a knowing look. Like, maybe, maybe <laughs> not. You know, like, you not never know. They could prove in court. <laughs> exactly. So maybe he does. And he, he's not denying it. You know what I mean? Kind of, you know, like it really, and it, he leaves it a little open. And I'll have to look for I, that next time. I did not know. I, knowing look. I, it's, it been a while since I'd seen the movie and I picked it up this time, this subtlety and Woody Harrelson's one of those actors that I forget how good he can be. Like if he has, a, you know, the right role. Like he can do a lot with it. I really liked him in this. I never really analyzed his acting and I don't really mm -hmm. analyze it much now, but I thought about, okay, well, how is Woody Harrelson in this role? And there, yeah, uh, <laughs> he's not just, which, which probably is more subtle in its own way, but he's not just Woody from Cheers. You right. Know, this is more of the natural born killers type. Oh, he can act. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. Stuff. Exactly. And I feel like well, he, and you see him go Flint, through um, speech down pretty well. Yeah. And he goes through a transformation throughout, like with the, the character throughout the film too. Yeah. And the Althea scene. Yeah. The bathroom is. Yeah. You know, pretty good. And yeah, uh, I, I mean, a lot of a lot of the things are just movie things. You know what? Alan is really like five or six lawyers. Alan wasn't the one that got shot. It was a no. lawyer that got shot. Um, but it is the speech before the Supreme Court is the like verbatim the speech like the. Like the the case that what he argued in court. Yeah, yeah, I like that they used the transcripts. I wondered. I like I, that they used that. I was curious about uh, initially. I just wondered how many of the court scenes they used transcripts, and uh, all I kept finding. I knew was that that final that, one that they used it for the Supreme Court one, but I didn't see them really talk about transcripts being used in other scenes. Just the Supreme Court stuff, but that doesn't, right. you know, absent ab absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Right, exactly. But oh. uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it it definitely, and then I mean that's, and then um, you know, I always love James Cromwell that plays Charles Keating. <laughs> Going back to him, but um, he just kind of pops in here and then you know james carville him playing again i mean the conservative guy when he's like such the liberal right. uh pundit like i just uh, i kind of he's done that before i don't I forget what film it was but he's done that before but um and then we have Crispin Glover <laughs> popping up, uh, Arlo. <laughs> doing That's Crispin right. Glover Arlo. stuff. <laughs> I, did, did, I, did that character have um, the eye thing, or is that just Crispin Glover doing Crispin Glover? I don't know. I don't know. I... I kind of feel like it's something he came up with for the character. <laughs> that's what my gut would tell me, but I don't know if that's a fact. <laughs> but yeah. it, nothing would please me more <laughs> if that were true. Yeah, he probably talked about it. Did you ever listen to... I feel like he had a podcast or there was a podcast with a bunch of Crispin Glover interviews. The, when I first kind of started listening and I didn't 
just listen to all of my friends' podcasts plus like three other yeah. ones that I find time yeah. for. Uh, I I feel like he had a podcast. It was or you know it was, maybe it was just ripped from cable access or something, but it was him yeah. just talking about whatever. Uh, this is really bad podcasting. So I'm gonna think about that later. <laughs> okay. Maybe he was on Stephen Tobolowski's podcast, which I know totally exists because I used to listen to that all the time. And they seem like they'd probably be friends. Yeah. But yeah, right. Crispin Glover, uh, what's his name? The guy that um, is also always there. He was... Vincent Sch- um, yes. Schiavelli, Schiavelli that yeah. plays Chester. Yes. Yeah. The guy who was... He's a great character actor. We talked about him a lot during the Death yeah. to Smoochie episode. Yeah, he was the assassin. Yeah. <laughs> the, the junkie assassin. Yeah, Bucky, Bucky something. <laughs> Bucky. <laughs> uh, yeah, good Ooh. cast. Uh, it Fun, not fun story, but, you know, it's... The Larry Flint story, they... <laughs> They made it seem like he only started doing drugs after he got shot when he'd been doing amphetamines and stuff since the, what, 60s? Right. (laughs) Right. 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 But again, when you're telling your story, (laughs) probably gloss over some of that, especially if. Uh, it seemed like he did eventually kind of quit doing drugs, but not as readily as he does in the movie either. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Like I said, never got to go out to the, the Hustler Mansion parties, Mr. Collins. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's okay. It would have been awkward. Well, not really. I mean, It's not like... It's, you know, people's vision of it's it's not like the party, his Fourth of July party or whatever is in this movie seemed like just yeah. a lot of people, sometimes famous people eating and drinking. But those are just the pictures I got to see. Right. <laughs> I don't know. His dad was always kind of a beer drinker and I don't think he even drinks anymore. How would I know? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> eh, you know, I don't know how much of that was cut out, but I've been more rambly. I feel like I've been more rambly. Norm MacDonald. <laughs> Norm MacDonald just shows up. <laughs> I just, when he does, you're kind of like, wait, what? <laughs> you have a feeling he's almost saying to say something like, you want to buy a monkey? Although that's David Letterman's line in Cabin Boy, which someday I think I will make us do on this show. Um, like a commentary someday. or an analysis? Oh, I don't know. Not who knows sometime in, in, in this podcast is future, however long down the road, but that's a, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah well, I'll hold off. It's not like it was next on my list, but it's been a long time since I've watched that movie. It's um, same with me, but I, it holds some weird place in my heart. You, yeah, you find a way to bring it up on multiple <laughs> podcasts, on, on podcasts I've just heard you on. It just every, I don't know how many, how many words, but eventually it all comes back to Cabin Boy. Really? I, I, when else have I mentioned it? I <laughs> now I'm intrigued. You, you somehow brought it up one of the times when it was you, Bo, and Jamie. 
on Devour. Okay. Yeah. That I buy. And because when I, blows around, you might talk about monkeys. It can true. happen. And, and I think of that line from that movie. <laughs> and I feel like you brought it up at least two or three times before. But also some of our conversations are not on podcasts. But you you bring up Cabin Boy, not not at an alarming rate, but at a noticeable rate. I was not aware of it, but thank you. Oh, now yeah, I'm going to think about this. I thought I thought it was well known that it's one of one of your like sp- special place on the shelf kind of movies. But maybe I just know you really well and I didn't know. <laughs> That's funny. I, I hadn't. I hadn't, uh, it hadn't occurred to me. So, um, Don't thank you. Don't be conscious about it. It's okay. It's okay to like Cabin Boy as much as you do. <laughs> it's got Ann Magnuson in it, too. <laughs> <laughs> From Bondwater. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. Chris Elliott comes up probably a decent amount in circles of, you know, there's always somebody talking yeah. about Get a Life. There's always somebody talking about Scary Movie 2 yeah. and yeah. Cabin Boy. And yeah, so I th- I think the likelihood of you bringing up Cabin Boy, the odds are against you because there's a lot of mental triggers everywhere. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Pipes. Uh, anytime somebody talks about pipes, I bet you think of that line. And that's really all I remember. I'm sure I'll remember stuff as I watch it. But Chris Elliott is not in this movie. No, I you, we went on some diversion. Um, Norm Macdonald. It's Norm Macdonald's fault. It was Norm Macdonald. Like I said, that's what I mean. It almost, his appearance almost takes you out of the movie <laughs> so that you're like, wait, where am I? You kind of, because while this movie has some comedic moments, he, I, I don't know, he is so comedic. <laughs> And that's not to say that comedians can't do drama. But there's something about his presence that it, it doesn't come across <laughs> as more dramatic. And you just expect him to, what to come out of his mouth, like his facial expression. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what and maybe it's a stereotype that I have of him. It could be. I mean, he doesn't have a big range in delivery when he talks. Maybe that's what it is. Uh, it's it's pretty Norm Macdonald. I mean, it, it, <laughs> at least in what I've seen, you you know, when he gets angry, he's louder. And, uh, you know, it's just sort of the similar cadence and stuff. And I think I saw him on YouTube talking mm-hmm. about how he was supposed to have a longer part but he pissed off foreman uh yeah who might have actually said i thought you could act when i hired you for this part or something like that um yeah and yeah uh, he also pointed out that he took it he took it he's a he took a taxi to the to the house because he couldn't drive so he couldn't drive for the original scene yeah. So if if it seems jarring, the a reporter rushing up to Larry Flint's mansion in the middle of the night, possibly in his pajamas, took a taxi. It's because Norm Macdonald can't drive, or at least couldn't drive in 1995. I believe it, because well, think about this: if he was a New Yorker and he grew up here or something. Many adults that live here have a state ID, but they don't know how to drive. Totally. It's not uncommon. We were talking about this before we started the the show. (laughs) That was a whole rambling thing that we didn't include. And, um, yeah. that for the Legion Patreon. Am I right? 
<laughs> right. <laughs> Car talk with <laughs> Vanessa and Darren. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. I, yeah, last time I was behind the wheel of a car was probably, ooh, I can't even tell you. Long, long time. And we've got pretty shitty public transit here. But it's all right. But anyway. (laughs) Anyway, what was the point of that? We were talking about uh, the casting and we sort of uh, got to Norm MacDonald, but chronologically yeah norm mcdonald like i said he just takes me out of it and i it's kind of and that's just it takes a lot he's not even in here that much but it takes a lot to get back to the story (laughs) and get back in the mood of it for me I really noticed that this time. I (laughs) wish obviously if I if I keep getting distracted when I'm talking about it. You can tell how it's affected me. (laughs) I wonder if it was added to because that is that does also I I agree that it's sort of just hey, Norm McDonald's here is not the same. You know, other people play other people and they sort of blend into the role. And that by I don't know if that was put in because it was sort of amongst a bunch of trial, like trial, jail, bail, trial, jail, bail. Norm Macdonald. Yeah, I, I I think that got thrown in there possibly. Well, I don't know, thrown in there. Uh, maybe it was put there for that. I don't I I don't know, but yeah, I I totally see what you're saying. I mean, largely, the movie is Larry Flint talking about the free speech and religious uh, prosecution of porn, and um, a lot of his a lot of his trials, and it was, what it's like thirty five years of his life, forty years of his life. If you don't count, well, the, if if you. Just, count with when he's like 20 or whatever not the little kid because it's a whole lot of his life then yeah I mean it really goes if you don't count yeah don't count him as a child that was in the 50s he opened the Hustler Club that was what late 60s it's the first scene that takes place or something, and then it goes into the the police have joined us if you, you know, because they gotta break up the party. Too many people having fun, you know. Um, <laughs> as usual, <laughs> we're talking about porn. Um, and um, anyway, in and so I think it goes into the nineties. Yeah, I mean, it probably is what the expectation is the because it seems it's at least after late eighties. I mean, it was made in ninety six or came out in ninety six. Yeah, it came out in ninety six. Uh, the Jackie O stuff was seventy two. Um, I think seventy five was. The Cincinnati trial. So seventy eight was Georgia. So at seventy eight was Georgia when he yeah. got shot. Seventy eight was Georgia. Yeah. Uh, Eighty three is the surgery. Uh, to yeah. What deadened nerves in his back. Right. Um. The copyright infringement trial was eighty four. Althea. Mm-hmm. Um. Althea died in 87. Uh, bah, bah, bah. The, the Supreme Court case was 88. Yeah. So, and then they have the, this guy, this piece of shit, was part of a savings and loan scandal. This guy's still... That was 88, yeah. Yeah. 
and talked about Larry Flint and how they never found his attempted assassin. Although it seems well like now, everybody's pretty well now on this. No, 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 no. Let's no. So let's take a break. Ah. And then we're going to come back. And Vanessa's going to tell you about the guy who shot him. So you're, it's not. Because, you know, I got to talk about serial killers. <laughs> and is this the person with the initials JPF or? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. okay. So, okay. I, I at least knew that much, but okay. Uh, yeah, we will be right back. Yeah. This will keep you quiet. Oh, hi there. I didn't see you. You caught me cutting a new show. I'm Bo Ransdell, and I'm one of the many creators you can find on Legion Podcasts. I said quiet! My fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting, but that comes at a cost. What's that like to live deliciously? Not that, but also yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs, costs for good microphones and software for editing, all the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really, you can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash legionpodcasts. For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon, and for five dollars, you can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on patreon.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. We appreciate it, and thank you for listening. Now, back to the cutting room. Okay, so, I'm not arguing that because he did confess to it, and it was proven, but... Um, so they did find, despite what the film says, they did find the guy who attempted to kill Larry Flint. It's Joseph Paul Franklin. Um, and who, okay, here's, here's one of my connections. He was born and grew up in Mobile. I mean, I wasn't born there, but I grew up largely there in Alabama. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> that might explain something. That place will make you crazy. Uh, but he was a serial killer known as the racist killer. I'm like, there wasn't like a better name, but really all of his, his crimes were race-based. Uh, not that there haven't been some others, but his were very, I guess, specific, you know, specific about the way it was done at that time. And he just got the nickname first. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm just like, seriously, like you can't come up with something better, but, um, and it was, you know, a, the, the, he did say that the reason he went after Larry Flint was interracial um, pictorials. Which was one of the things that they all guessed could have been the reason when they were writing in yes. the limousine. Yes, because Larry Flint had gotten like death threats over that. And so he had put through death threats before. Um. I believe. And, you know, but he had a history already before this of stalking and shooting like um, black people or interracial couples. Um, some of the people he had actually did kill. Some ended up like Larry Flint ended up surviving and, uh, but there were two of the ones that actually were killed were two black teenagers 
in that were killed in Cincinnati, like around the corner from one of my old apartments. Um, like the old, like going to just the corner store. And they were, they were like 13 and 14. And they were just walking to the store. Doing nothing. Like, you know what I mean? Like, not to say that there's any reason to go and shoot someone. Especially, oh, I'm going to shoot someone over their, over their, you know, their race. But it's kind of like, you're, no one, no one's like threatening you. Or, you know, you can't, like. No, they're not bothering anyone. They're just, you're just upset about their existence. Like, I don't, I just, people like that, I just don't get. Is that maybe why he's called the racist killer? Because that's it? It's just so, like, I'm racist. I'm just going to randomly, like you said, it's... Like the the religious killers or other types of serial killers that I can't really talk about with any authority, but you know how there are some mm-hmm. types that at least think that they're doing something elaborate and big or whatever, and this guy is just right. I'm a racist piece of shit and I'm gonna kill. <laughs> well, and that's that, attack. and that's it. It just and it seems like I mean from what I've been able, what I've read about him and and is that it doesn't seem like he was even like oh affiliated with any hate group <laughs> like oh i'm going to a clan meeting or the neo nazi like no i just i'm a white guy who hates black people and i hate interracial you know type you know relationships i mean like <laughs> Wow, that is awfully, I guess, specific but vague. <laughs> I mean, really, I guess that's why it's just the racist killer. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. But no. But I'll- anyway, <laughs> it was it, it. The interesting thing is that so it was he did kind of um, confess to it in the seventies. But he got away, and and um, yeah, and then he kind of moved and continued killing, and like, and so he was he killed in like Cincinnati area, and then yeah, the Atlanta area, and I I think there was another area, but it mostly kind of around there. His Wikipedia and, has like eight states. Yeah, it and but anyway, it was only you know it was a while before he was actually caught. It was what like ninety seven or two thousand. It was two thousand, and that he was finally caught. You know, and what. And it was proven that he he did uh, try to kill Larry Flint. But what I find interesting is that Larry Flint went and spoke, like, at the sentencing. And he also, he liked to campaign against the death penalty for him. And even though the guy was sentenced to death row and... He did. He was. He was ultimately uh, executed. And Larry Flint, before he was executed, yet again, kind of rallied around and said, "No, don't do this. This isn't helping anything." And I think that speaks. That says volumes about Larry Flint and his politics. In that, you know what I mean. It's it's still this very much, you know, I'm not saying, oh, he has necessarily forgiven, <laughs> you know, if you want. I, I mean, he didn't even necessarily say anything about that. He's just like, it's just not, it's just not right. It doesn't make a difference, which is yeah. true. I mean, that's, and, I mean, it ultimately doesn't. Um, right. He's more anti-death penalty than pro his assassin. Right, exactly. No, exactly. And 
you know, I, I, I thought that was kind of interesting, but I mean, he, you know, Franklin was, like I said, uh, died by lethal injection anyway, but, uh, yeah. So I had, you know, I had to get in my, this wasn't just, you know, and I love that this was a movie produced by Oliver Stone and you get your Kennedy assassin, you know, book depository style <laughs> set up of, you know, Franklin going to shoot Larry Flint. <laughs> it, it reminded me so much of it. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah he, he assembles his rifle and... But I'm like, where's the grassy knoll? <laughs> well, it's Georgia. It's all over the place. Yeah. And yeah, it did not do very well in the theaters. I, no. I, what was this R? Yes. I, I would say I wasn't old enough to get into an R rated movie when it came out. So it's not my fault. Yeah. Well, because it, I mean, the because of the nudity and language. Yeah. And the drug, well, the drug use too. Yeah. I mean, all of those things, you know, but the nudity alone would like that much would make it R. Yeah. Um, but the, um, the critics did give it good reviews. Well, there were some Oscar nominations too. Exactly. Which, yeah, <laughs> that would have been it cool that like Woody Harrelson's Oscar was was for this movie if that would have happened. Well, you know, Larry Flint was his plus one was to he? the Oscars. You were probably he was. watching the Oscars already. Or oh, yeah, like, for like 10 years before that or your whole life. Probably. I kind of picture you just Pro yeah, watching the Oscars your entire life. Yeah, exactly. I have been. Um, it, there's just certain things in my life that are like that. That and like the NBA finals. Yeah. <laughs> Weird dichotomy. <laughs> hey, you know, I'm I'm a hockey fan. That's I know. <laughs> that's it. My team, my favorite team was eliminated from playoff contention last night. I, w I I've been thinking about you. I, I I know. Oh, you've you've heard you've heard what's been happening in Columbus. Yeah. That'll be a, yeah. <laughs> speaking of murder, it's been <laughs> painful. Or speaking of dr doing drugs to uh, get rid of the pain, it has been a painful season. As a fan of that team, but it's I don't know. Every time I well, I'll, start to get all sports fanny, I'm like, oh, wait, it's just sports. Well, I actually got to go to a basketball game the other day for the Nets game. Yeah. yeah, which was really strange because it was so empty <laughs> in, in Barclay Center because of the, you know, COVID restrictions. Yeah. Um. New York City still hasn't filled a lot of, you know, start a lot of things up uh, to certain capacities yet. And, uh, you know, I have my vaccination and I, you know, have my mask. But we were, you know, my mom and I, we were like, and our two and then like way away, like everybody was so far away. They gave everybody masks that were branded as you went in, they had an express line for vac people with vaccines, <laughs> oh, nice. as opposed, you know, as opposed to, to the other people who had to go through all these other things. And then you enjoyed your fascism with your vaccine passport. Yeah, and, but and then but they had. Um, security actually enforcing like if they saw someone who was leaving their mask down too long mm -hmm. like if they weren't eating or drinking they would actually tell them to put it back up i was like wow i'm, I'm kind of shocked <laughs> did 
Did did you watch the documentary The Day Sports Stood Still? Yes. Oh, okay. That's yes. what I thought of when you started talking about that. I yes. That um <laughs> I was watching NBA <laughs> game at that time. And they cut in. Right. It was like a very heated game. My mother and I are still bitter about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Okay. Um... So, but, but, but so, um, no, it is nice to be out in the world again, but it, it, I don't know. These, we're talking about, it seems like in a way that we're rambling, but it kind of seems like the same thing that we're talking about with Larry Flint. And I'm not going to get into a big political rant because I know this isn't your political podcast, but because I did bring up vaccines and masks and all that, and but the amount of people who say it's vile violating their, you know, First Amendment, their, you know, their rights and all of this because they have to, like, by saying that you have to wear a mask or whatever, I, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I've never been told what right it is a violation of. <laughs> I, I know, I, I'm, that's why I'm trying to grasp, I, I, some people were saying First Amendment, I'm like, no, I, what I'm, I'm 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 trying to I don't understand why you really think that I mean I, I don't know but but you know <laughs> it's it's like what you do have in this film with it I mean what it shows you with Larry Flynn's life in this film that I'm br I had it, I'm bringing it back that you have selective prosecution of laws or interpretations of laws like that's the whole slippery slope of censorship and obscenity laws because like Jesse Helms thing and Strom Thurmond I think Strom Thurmond was part of it too in you know, and in the uh, the eighties, when they had all the, the Mies Commission and all of that going into going uh, like really against pornography, and I really remember this. Um, this is a weird thing about me. I'm always very aware of the news because that's we always watched Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite, because that's the way it is. Um, while we were eating dinner, while we were eating dinner <laughs> after, <laughs> that was just our habit, that, how I grew up. And so from a very early age, I was watching those kinds of things. And then I was reading things and like, you know, pop, where like pop culture too. Uh, and yeah, I, I, yeah, I was just always, I always read a lot, but I, we subscribed to people magazine at one point and they had great coverage of the Mies commission and then like Tipper Gore and the MPAA, all of that same kind of wave of, but I've been into all of this censorship and First Amendment kind of this whole discussion since a, from a very young age. Uh, and the 80s was such an interesting time for that. And then as I got older and like into like, and in the the nineties, and when I you know was in college, um, 
as I was reading m- like more things about like different feminist writings and types of things, getting into some of the the war against pornography that happened in the 70s and then 80s. And you do see some of it in this film. Um, But I love that near the, what is it, the beginning of the movie, you see Larry Flint, he's walking into Hustler Club and he's walking through a group of you know, quote unquote Christians who are picketing and they're saying, you know, this is against God and Jesus or whatever the signs say um, that indicates that they're Christian. And, and he says, Oh, you're welcome to come in. We welcome Christians too. I mean, like, (laughs) you know, he was always put it pushing buttons thank you Zora and it it was just does Zora have an enemy called buttons that I don't know about I don't know sorry um and I, I don't know and maybe and and that's what I find interesting because I have always kind of felt the need to do that myself. (laughs) Like, and I remember at school that we got into, this was in high school, maybe 11th grade. And it was some sort of, I don't know, some sort of, history or like a a contemporary history or civics type poli sci whatever they labeled the class and I remember getting into the discussion and I was arguing for magazines like Playboy and Hustler and I remember everybody being shocked that I would say that because they're like you call yourself a feminist and you're so like, so this one way, why we don't understand. And I'm like, I'm like, you got to look at the first amendment. Right. First and foremost, you don't have to like the content that they have the right to sell, you know, and I was going into all of that discussion of course, I wasn't telling them that, no, I'm perfectly fine with the content. <laughs> Porn is a healthy thing, in my opinion, you know. <laughs> um, it, it can be, at least. Um, not always. But it's... Um, it's just... <sighs> yeah, I don't know. I, I, I find the argument... The, the the whole Supreme Court scene on all of that and the and the argument made I find interesting. And is that um is that a good Scalia? Yeah. That actor, would you say? I thought it was Scalia. I was like, how the fuck did right? they get Scalia to do this? I- uh-huh. <laughs> I was going to say, it looks, I I had to do a double take, but I knew it wasn't Scalia because I had done that, like, I've done that every time I watch the movie. (laughs) Because I'm like, oh my goodness, he looks and sounds so much like Anthony Scalia. Yeah. Like, did they, did he, you know, because he, (laughs) did he just say, it was like, fuck it, I want to be in the movie and I'm Anthony Scalia. Uh Or Antonin, yeah, is it Anthony or Antonin, or is that just Italian for Anthony? It's spelled Anthony, but it's Antony. Okay, it, um, it it's an Italian. But, but Scalia, who like was weird, he yeah. was a horrible 
politically, I hated him, but everybody said that yeah. he was nice to be around. One of those people. Well, Ginsburg, he and Ginsburg had that relationship, which, you know, that close friendship, which, I mean, whatever, well, I James guess. James Carville from the movie and his wife, the, aren't they uh, opposite versions of each other? Yeah, politically, absolutely. Yeah, they're polar opposites. I could never do that, but hey. I, I couldn't either. Not on that front. I mean, there are certain things, yeah, I could do that on, but that's not one of them. I'm sorry. I just can't. <laughs> but yeah, I, was, I yeah, I, I thought the same thing. I said, how did they get Scalia in this? And I guess it, I guess it worked as a younger Sandra Day O'Connor, but I kind of felt like they should have aged her up a little. Yeah. Because I was trying to think, I'm like, when this was done, she already was, a, she was already graying at least a little bit. I could have sworn, you know. And then I was like, and trying to remember what Renquist looked like. <laughs> you know, I got started thinking about all of them after, I don't, you know, that wasn't a really good, um, what's his, what's his name? Oh, oh, Jesus Christ. I can't, I'm, I'm blanking. Um, let's see. Yeah, the only one that I thought was really good was uh, Scalia. So Scalia. I'm not sure who you think wasn't good. That could, um, that could be anybody. Yeah, I'm just, I'm blanking. But it, it was just... And yeah, and then, of course, I, I, you know, it was also my memory of, I was just trying to remember what the Supreme Court all looked like at that time, too. But I knew Sandra Day O'Connor looked a little off, but she she looked, I guess, close enough that, you know what I mean, um, in her facial features and her expressions. Yeah. Uh, the court during that case was Chief Justice William Rehnquist, William J. Right. Brennan, Byron White, Thurgood Marshall, Harry Blockmum, John P. Stevens, Sandra Day O'Connor, Scalia, and Kennedy. Anthony Kennedy. I think Kennedy looked okay, if I remember. If I'm... I wasn't sure about Thurgood remember. Marshall. Thurgood Marshall... Didn't look quite right to me. That was what threw me off. And that's, I had to stop and think. I'm like, yeah. See, but like I said, Kennedy like if, if, kind if of good was okay. Sick. Right. And, and that, that was what I, again, I was trying to remember like how old he was at that time. So he might have been older and more and like sickly at that time. I guess and they were trying to reflect that. He died in 93. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I really, but I didn't think he was that old at that point. Yeah, or that at least that thin. He was born in 1908 like he, and died in 1993. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> Scalia. That's yeah. okay. It's, it's, we're... <laughs> it's... Obviously. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the Supreme Court case, that was a really cool. Good argument. Nothing against writers. You know, I, I did some screenwriting and creative <laughs> classes in college. And sometimes it's hard to come up with believable yeah. dialogue. But this yeah. is... Uh, I don't know, sort of like a an argument come up with by a well, civil rights lawyer, <laughs> you know, not a writer. Well, well, I think. Well, we know that this trans this was taken from the actual transcript. The yeah. the final argument was, but we're not sure about the other court scenes. I kind of I feel some of them were like the. I, sorry, I cut you off. I, I've got something to say. I, well, I was going to say, 
I, it doesn't, I don't, I don't know if it, if they aren't, I think they're believable court dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. But like the, when he's getting overruled by judge Larry Flint and stuff and he's just saying, excuse me, did you just say no? That, that's something that yeah. I hope is from the transcript. <laughs> Oh, no, I do, too. And something tells me that's probably close to the truth, if not the truth, <laughs> because I I know I've I've heard stories about some of the courts there in Hamilton County. And some of the rulings from like those judges uh, like some of them, it, it was like, if they just felt like, if they felt like they didn't care or they just want to screw with you, you know, yeah, they like, just had a personal, they had a personal, like political gain, you know, that they at hand, they would totally like, whatever. Nope. Sorry. They had their mind made up ahead of time. Yeah, no, it wasn't uncommon. I know that they were doing that at even the 90s. Well, I mean, there was a judge, uh, I forget where, that doubled a woman's bail when she said yeah instead of yes. Yeah. It's petty shit. Oops, she just doubled my bail. <laughs> you just doubled my bail. <laughs> <laughs> Well, exactly. and, okay, and so here's another thing. When I lived in Cincinnati and I was a busser, I I worked in this, I bussed tables, like, during the lunch hour in this five-star restaurant. Well, the there would be a lot of lawyers. It was downtown Cincinnati, and so a lot of, lawyers and judges would come in there and there was one in particular who every single day would come in for lunch and would have in regular large water glasses straight vodka and you had to present it as if it were water you couldn't, and only, like, his server could handle it. It was, like, this whole weird, like, arrangement. It, like, but everybody knew. We are just like, oh, my God. But, yeah, and then he'd go back to the courtroom and proceed on, a, you know, cases. <laughs> this was a judge. And I'm like, great. And he had been doing it for years. I think that's a cheap so, song, maybe. You know, it, that's the kind of thing that seems like, oh, that's some small, stupid town, you know, backwoods that doesn't know any better. Excuse? Drag racing in the hallway again? They might have the window open in the hallway. That's why you're hearing it. No. Sorry. Um, but, um, but, you know... You would expect that out of, like, something out of, like, backwoods, Alabama town, and, like, my cousin Vinny, right? <laughs> no. You know what I'm saying? Two youths, what? Um, and... <sighs> that was a very nice judge. You bite your tongue. He's the opposite of yeah. crooked. Right. But I know, that's what I'm saying. He's not... That, but you would expect yes. that kind of stereotype in that setting well like uh whatever and ralph what, macchio and his friend were saying about getting arrested in the south they're preconceived yeah reasons. yeah yeah exactly and it's like okay cincinnati you think it's a bigger city they might not be so bad they're just like oh my god this is terrible <laughs> like and it was the 90s, too. It wasn't like this is the way they used to do it, you know, 
years and years ago. It's pretty recent. <laughs> yeah, some some judges suck. Um <laughs> I'm not saying all of them. I'm not saying all of them too. But you know, when you hear st- when you hear stories like that, you're just like, that does not give me a lot of faith in the legal system. But we anyway, need, I, the system needs needs lots of reform. Uh, well, it does. And when you have these laws, to get back to more like. Larry Flint in this movie. <laughs> when you have these laws where it's dealing with the obscenity and it's like, what is pornography? Well, I know it when I see it. That old, mm-hmm. to go back to ours, Mies Commission, I forget who said that, like, definition. Uh, you know, I know it when I see it. It's like the definition of obscenity whatever community standard. Well, but that's so subjective. (laughs) Like it really is like, it could be it. There's so many ways to interpret that. If you just get one, you know, prosecutor who's going to be like a Simon Lee's, you know, who gets on board with whatever Christian coalition and whatever politicians, because, oh yeah, they were, there's some big money politicians in Cincinnati. Uh, Yeah. And love or hate whatever he has done with his content, (laughs) you know, you got to give Larry Flint the fact that he's not back down. Yeah. Hello. No, I, oh. I I thought you were still talking, so I was oh. trying not to interrupt you. That he's not back down. Yeah. You're never backed down. Yes, that was the end of my sentence and my thought. <laughs> because yeah, I mean, he died three months ago. As as we are in February, this, in February, yeah, yeah. So two months ago, uh, time is a flat circle. I don't know where I am. What's going on? Growing <laughs> right, I uh, pandemic beard right now. Don't know why. Times are weird. Well, and when you have a birthday, I just had last month. I had my first birthday in a pandemic. And it it was just when you realize you've had a birthday in a pandemic, especially when my birthday was last year was right before the pandemic, like everything shut down, like it's really weird and surreal. <laughs> oh yeah, but, <laughs> I'm I mean, like, wait yeah. a minute, like I, I, it's like a, I don't get where. The, what time portal did I go down? Yeah, it's, it's those, those weird memories. Um, so, yeah, that February this year. Um, I don't know. From, from what I understood, he also most likely was kind of physically abusive with some of his spouses. I think... Yeah, I think there was some of that. Um, Which he does hit. I don't. He have, does hit Althea once in the or she, in you know, this in in this, but it, right. It's you know never do that to me again, and then it never happens again. So again, right. Telling a story about your life. Um. But yeah, uh, it, on on the whole, why. <laughs> If it protects me, it protects the rest of you because I'm I'm the worst or something like that. Yeah, that that sort of thing. And the the George Orwell and he quote. Did, he he did kind of yeah have that philosophy. Yeah. So. I mean, he wasn't just a pervert, <laughs> <laughs> but he openly admitted that he was a pervert. Like he, you know. 
Hugh Hefner was tried to be like, well, you I'm know, classy. I'm classy. I've got all these other things. I'm a man of many interests. And Which you're just like fun of in the movie. Yeah, I know. And I love that because that was what this was a reaction to in part. I mean, and so was Penthouse. Yeah. Y- you know? That was a different band I was in had a write up in Penthouse. Ah. Oh. Bob Guccione. My dad, speaking of Bob Guccione, because he also published Omni magazine. Do you remember that? No. It it was one of, yeah, one of his many, yeah, things that went under. Um, was that one of the magazines but, that Stephen King was published in? I know he got published in a lot of sort of gentleman yeah. magazines. Well, it was, it was more like science fiction and fantasy um so sorry so stephen king might have been published in it but i remember my dad subscribed to it it, but like it would have short stories in it yeah and essays like about like scientific things like actual science type stuff it was it was but it it was um yeah it was kind of a weird mix and i I, that's obviously one of the reasons it went under (laughs) yeah yeah it does very slow i looked looked a lot at the operating like costs and functions of publishing because when i was nearing the end of college i was like what the fuck can i do with this literature this degree in creative writing and literature that the good old ba in english so i was looking at publishing shit and it's yeah there's very narrow margins doesn't take a lot to go under doing that shit i know i know but it yeah i mean it's the fact that they were even able to really get it off the ground but he at least was already making enough money that they had multiple locations in the Cincinnati area of the Hustler Club right you know so he at least started out I mean well he started out obviously they show if you believe this tale just him busting his butt to get any bit of money from just a young age because they were dirt poor, runs. you know. So he had the drive to do something, and yeah, uh, it was very famous. Uh, there were. I don't yeah. know what else to say. I mean, but I mean, do you have anything you wanted to say about the 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 censorship laws and the the legal cases? No, I think I think we hit it pretty pretty well. Okay. I think I think we uh, have reached and now the end is near. Um but before we totally go, before we get to the parts that I think that sometimes people skip when they listen to a show often, you know, the the housekeeping of the emails and whatnot. You need to say. Well, before we get to say that, I think we're saying we would both recommend the movie. Yeah, yeah, totally. It goes without saying, but we, we just did to not wrap talk up, about movie Courtney discussion. Love, really? <laughs> no, we didn't actually, and we should have because she did do. I mean, you can say, well, she was a junkie, and so she was just playing herself. No, actually. She did. She played a nuanced. Perf- she put in a nuanced performance. She really did. I she and she did. got clean to play this role and stayed clean after. Actually, oh, that's cool. Well, I did not know that. Yeah, she. She. Uh, but and going back to the Oscars, Sharon Stone 
lent her the dress that she wore to the Oscars. Oh, cool. So it was something that Sharon Stone had worn before, before, and Sharon Stone thought she deserved to have something that nice when she went in case, yeah. She had to go, like, give whatever interviews and stuff. Ah, okay. Well, that was cool. I thought that, I I heard that story, and I'm like, I thought that was so nice. Nice. Random, a random thing. Yeah, random acts of kindness. It's not like they really knew each other, (laughs) either. Maybe she was a fan of Hole or Nirvana. Maybe. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, I recommend the movie. It's, <laughs> it, it, well, yeah, it, it, it tells a cool story about freedom of speech amongst a bunch of entertaining visual scenes and stuff. And Larry Flint is good and, uh, throws, does some powerful work here and there. And, uh, <laughs> You got to see the really going against Jerry Falwell, all that stuff. You get to see, yeah. like we said, Larry Flint's impression of one of his least favorite judges. Uh, yeah, I would recommend this movie. It's yeah, there we go. I, <laughs> it's very old. It's weird to think about how old it is. Like it might be on uh, Turner Classic Movies before too long. I, well, I know. I was starting to think about that. I'm like, this was 96. So, yeah, okay. That is actually, it's, you know, it's older than I thought it was. I don't know why I was thinking it was, like, more like early 2000s. But, um. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I too would recommend this. And, and also we didn't mention Edward Norton as well. Uh, he's, all, I, I always like Edward Norton. Um, but. As Alan Isaacman. Alan. Yeah, which he, he plays, he plays well against the crazy Woody Allen. I mean, we, excuse me, Woody yeah. Harrelson. <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. I did not mean to say that. <laughs> that would be a fucked up version of the movie. That would be a... A, a new meaning that would when, be they, when he goes into the room and they start yelling, the pervert is back. I know. Oh my God. That would... <laughs> that just gave me heebie-jeebies. Um, well, to totally change the subject, we've already said we to were To totally the change the subject. Coming up next month is another anniversary for the show. And as usual, we do some sort of commentary, and Vanessa has picked it. I think I know what she's picked, but she hasn't actually told me. I'm going to find out with everybody else. Well, you know, we we've been doing these ones before... For anniversary shows, at least, that are not necessarily good movies. <laughs> not, I won't even say great movies. That they're they're just not necessarily the best. But we're just kind of like even like, oh, we can't even like they're so bad that we can really get into it. And it's really been we've been had. It's been such a hard choice at times. Um, so this time we actually decided to go a totally different direction with something I think we all like, (laughs) but I know that there's going to be plenty to say as we are watching it. Um, something tells me, uh, that there will be, we are going to watch, uh, our commentary for the anniversary David Lynch's Blue Velvet. <laughs> Little classy and arty, but it, yeah. It's no sleepwalkers, I'll you, tell you that. No, but we we will have plenty to say in the moment, especially if um, we are all imbibing 
um, in some form. So it's legal in New- it's legal in New York now. So <laughs> it's it's medical here. <laughs> but I might actually pull out some some alcohol for this. Ooh. So yes, so that, that is that. That will be next month. I yeah, I think it'll be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Be the first David Lynch. Nobody I know, can do, I'm... nobody can do uh, Lynch like Bo Ranstall. I know, I know. I We're know. not saying he's gonna be there, but no, but he maybe he could really give, good. Maybe he Lynch. could give us. A, maybe he could give us something for, for the show. Yeah, maybe he could introduce the show or something. I don't yeah, know. let's not. Put let's him, not let's not put spoil him on the any, line let's for not anything. promise anything. Let's not promise anything. Yeah. What we are saying is that right now we are planning on doing Blue Velvet. Blue Velvet. Yeah. That's it. That's all you get. Everything else is a treat. A fucking treat. Yeah. So do you have anything else uh going on? Outside of this show? Outside of this show, uh, episode 100 of Psychosemantic is going to be before our VD Clinic commentary episode. That will be the next one. Um, that will be sort of revisiting an old discussion topic. Woody Allen might come up even. And, and I think that's why I thought about it. <laughs> It like popped out of my mouth. <laughs> you will be there. Had I, thoughts. <laughs> I've had thoughts. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't really have any other plans. There's some topics and a couple movies in the works over there, but anytime I actually say something, then it doesn't happen. Um, and yeah, like I said, just hanging out. Uh, it's warming up enough that I can play drums in the garage again. And yeah, uh, Danzig's getting ready to get out of kindergarten. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then then summer will be upon us, and I'm I am on the podcast under the stairs. Uh, I don't know what he's gonna do next summer, but the summer series of doing yeah. a decade. Uh, we are now into up to twenty twenty. <laughs> or 2021 yeah. i forget which one they stop on i would imagine it's the decade um but i don't have any i have early years i have 2010 and 2014 so mm. some good stuff but a whole it's not like horror movies are you know we're towards the end of the decade right right uh but yeah so <laughs> just watching Trying to catch up on some of those movies. I'm a bit more patchy, depending on the year. <laughs> mm-hmm. And yeah, Psychosemantic. And what about you? All good? Anything to plug? Um, Nothing at the moment. All right. Nothing to report. So we have been the VD Clinic podcast. Uh, VD Clinic pod and all the places you want to look us up. Uh, but we did mention the... <laughs> the Legion Patreon. Uh, we will be coming up with something cool to do for that. And but that's really all we know is that we know we're gonna do something cool. Uh, until next time, I think that's it for me. And please, and you know, if you want to send any messages to us, you know, for the anniversary show or for us, to even even if they don't make it in time for the anniversary show, um, the episode after. That's cool as well, but uh, we would love to hear from you. Okay. Um, Thank you for listening as usual. And until next time, I'm Vanessa saying goodbye. And I already said bye, but I'm still Darren. (laughs) 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 
Thank you for listening to another episode of the VD Clinic. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find us at Twitter at VD Clinic Pod or reach us via email at vdclinicpod at gmail.com. We also have a Facebook group, VD Clinic Podcast. We'd love to hear your feedback, suggestions, and more.